I'm happy to kind of give an overall revision for the students of 10th, class 10, for the upcoming examination. So very soon you will be taking a kind of test in English. Probably tomorrow is the day of test for you. So before you kind of <coughs> take your examination, have a look at these points which I've written on the blackboard. I'm sure you might have been revising. You are aware of the syllabus. And I will definitely discuss the points in focus. What do you mean by points in focus? The points of every lesson that you need to focus on. The important part in every lesson or parts in every lesson have to be discussed. So for the syllabus, we have a letter to God, Nelson Mandela, Dust of Snow, and Fire and Ice. Dust of Snow and Fire and Ice are the two poems that you have. And a letter to God and Nelson Mandela. This, these two lessons are from the first flight. And then you have the first lesson in uh, the supplementary book that is Footprints Without Feet. Read the first two lessons. The first two lessons in the supplementary book that is Footprints Without Foot. I have not mentioned them over here, but they are included in the syllabus. Now to start with this a letter to God. Before uh, you uh, read a lesson, you need to keep in certain points. And what are the points? Every lesson has a theme. The writer wants to share a message with us. What exactly is the theme? You should be aware of the theme. That is point number one. And the next important point is the characters of every lesson. For example, in lecture you have many characters. Lecture is the main character. Then you have the postmaster and the staff in the post office. Okay, so the major characters they include lecture and the postmaster. So the theme you should be well aware of the theme. You should also be aware of the character, and you should be aware of the dialogues. Every lesson has a dialogue. I mean, they have many dialogues. So the speakers of the lesson. They might say something. So who says this? To whom did he say this? Where is he? These are some of the questions you need to focus on. Because extracts would be given. You will have extracts from the lesson. And the extracts would have questions. And the questions are directly related to the passage that is given. So you cannot just rely on the book back questions. Every lesson has book back questions. But that doesn't mean you have to focus on that. Until and unless you learn the lesson thoroughly, you understand the concept of the lesson thoroughly, you give a thorough reading, you won't be able to answer the questions which are given. So, we start with the letter to God, the first lesson. Who is the main character? Obviously, nature. And what is the character of nature? What are the values that you see him possess? He is a God-fearing man. He is a hard-working man. How do you know that he was a God-fearing man? Because he tells his wife and the family, don't worry because God will not allow us to die of hunger. Why did he say this? Lencho was cultivating corn. His house was located on a hilltop. And down below the valley was the field which belonged to his family. So they had cultivated corn. But unfortunately, a heavy rain came and destroyed the entire crop. So when the crop was destroyed, they had nowhere to go and nothing to do now. What, where would the next meal come from? So when the whole family was devastated, Lencho comes in and says, don't worry. God is not going to allow anybody to die of hunger. This shows that he was a man of God. He had a faith, a strong belief and strong faith in God. Number two, he wrote a letter directly to God. And what was the content of the letter? He wrote two letters. You have to be, you have to be thorough with the two letters. In the first letter, if you notice, he asks for 100 pesos from God. And he did not write the letter to human beings, but he wrote the letter to God. And this tells us that he was a man of God, an unshakable faith in God. Number two, he went to the post office the next Sunday to see if God has sent him the 100 pesos. He wanted to check it. Okay. So when he went to the post office to check the money, which he had already asked God, he found 70 pesos in the envelope. Now he knew that God would give him money, but the money was sharp. 30 pesos missing. So
So what was the content of the second letter? In the second letter he said, Lord, send me those 30 pesos once again, but don't send them directly to the send them directly to me. Don't send them to the people in the post office. Why? Because these people, they are a bunch of crooks. They are thieves. They cannot be relied upon. They are not reliable, unreliable. That is what he said. So, the first letter makes a request to God for 100 pesos. The second letter makes a request to God for 30 pesos, but the 30 pesos should be sent to him directly and not to the people in the post office because Lynch considered the people in the post office as a bunch of crooks. Now, what does the lesson tell us? It tells us to have faith in God. It is very good. It is necessary because without having faith in God, we cannot live a life. Our life is dependent on God. Second, don't suspect people. You see, God is everywhere. God can work through men. But unfortunately, Lencho did not understand this. He didn't understand that God can work in the form of human beings. So, the postmaster, his character is another major character, a very kind and a lovable person. He actually felt for Lecho. He was worried about Lecho. He was surprised at his faith, but at the same time, he was so worried that he felt something should be done to this man. So he donated part of his salary and he requested the staff to donate some salary and with the donation he raised 70 pesos. What a kind man he is. But Lencho did not understand his character. Lencho did not have faith in men though he had faith in God. So he suspected them. He called them as a bunch of crooks. That is where he went wrong. So remember, God works through people. And again, Lecho's reaction to the money, the character of the postmaster, what did he do to respond to the letter of Lecho? So if you can go over these points, that would be better. Now again, the lesson will have some difficult words, vocabulary. Go through the vocabulary, the words, difficult words, and get the meanings of these words. Another point, rain is compared. It is compared to coins, golden coins. What is the rain drops compared to? Obviously, golden coins. And what kind of golden coins? Uh, ten cents. The big coins were the ten cent coins. Okay. They were golden. And the smaller raindrops, I mean, the big raindrops were considered to 10 cents. Yeah, that is how it has been put there. The big raindrops are considered as 10 cents, coins. And the smaller raindrops are considered as 5 cents. They are shining silvery coins, 10 cents. The larger drop, Raindrops are considered to 10 cents and the smaller raindrops are considered to 5 cents. So a kind of what you call comparison, metaphor, you call this as metaphor because you compare the raindrops to coins as and like are not used there. The second point is there is a phrase there, Lencho was an ox of a man. So ox of a man is an expression, an idiomatic expression. What is the meaning of this idiomatic expression, ox of a man? It means a very, very hard-working man, a hard-working personality. So Lencho was definitely a hard-working personality. So while reading the lesson, underlying the idiomatic expressions, some phrases will be there and some hard words, learn the meaning of the hard words, the vocabulary. Right. Now we come to the next lesson that is Nelson Mandela. What are the expected questions? What are the important questions, the probable questions of this lesson? First of all, you must know as to who Nelson Mandela is. Nelson Mandela is undoubtedly one of the heroes of this century. Why is he called a hero? He's called a hero because he spent 22 long years, more than 22 Probably 27, yes. He spent 27 years in prison. 
How many years? 27. 27 long years. Why? Why should a man suffer in prison for 27 years? Is he abnormal? Has he gone out of his head? Has he gone crazy? No. He had a goal. He had a purpose. He had an objective in life and that is to free his own community, his race, that is the black Africans from the bondage of the white, the whites. So South Africa was dominated by the whites. Though the blacks were large in number, they were dominated by the whites. They were not allowed to vote for elections during elections. They had no right to vote. Healthcare was denied. Education was denied. They were considered as an unfortunate lot. There was discrimination, racial discrimination. So they lost their freedom. And what did Nelson Mandela do? He decided to fight for these people. And the fight ended up in 27 long years in prison. He did not bother about as to what would happen during these 27 years. He was ready to face any sort of consequence. He thought, I might die in the process, but that doesn't matter. One day, my nation, my race will experience the joy of freedom. That is why he was there in the prison. Now, what is important in this lesson is the inaugural speech. He gave an inaugural speech, a remarkable speech. And in that inaugural speech, he mentioned certain things. He speaks of freedom. He speaks of freedom to his people. He takes a promise. He makes a he takes a pledge. He takes a pledge. And what is a pledge? He pledges, he promises, he resolves to free the people from poverty. He promises freedom to his people from poverty, from suffering, from deprivation, and from racial discrimination or gender inequality. I repeat, this is a very important point that you need to keep in mind. Nelson Mandela promises freedom to his people and he promises to free them from poverty. No South African should remain or live in a world of poverty. Then he promises to release them from suffering. No one will suffer. Employment opportunities for all, healthcare education, healthcare facilities for all, education for all. So every man in South Africa, be it a white or a black, will live in peace, will live a life of satisfaction with all the basic needs fulfilled. So no more suffering. He promises a life without suffering, a life without poverty, a life, okay, without deprivation. What do you mean by deprivation? Not given something, denial. So education is only for the whites, not for the blacks. So the blacks are deprived of education. So he says, all will get education. Equal opportunities to all. Equal opportunities in education, in employment, in health care, all right? In uh, uh, the franchise, exercising their franchise, and that is voting rights. These are the promises that he makes. And no class differences in the sense. Gender inequality. What I mean here is gender inequality. And Nelson Mandela is very clear about this issue. No gender inequality will be there. Both men and women will enjoy the same privilege, will enjoy the same rights, will enjoy the same facilities. So there is no discrimination between men and women. No gender inequality. These are some of the things that he promises. And the day and the year on which he became the president, 4th May 1990, that was the time. So it was on this day that he delivered an inaugural speech, a significant inaugural speech. All right. There is one more thing which he talks about. The sun will never set. The sun, glorious sun, will never set on the achievements. Never set. 
The last line of the inaugural speech is very important. What is the sun that he is talking about? The sun will never set on such a glorious achievement. What is the glorious achievement that he is talking about? He is talking about the freedom. So, South Africa is not going to experience slavery anymore. That is the meaning. They have experienced the rising of the sun, the sun of freedom. They have experienced the joy of freedom. So, this freedom is to continue forever and ever and no more will the South Africans be subjugated, be made slaves or treated as slaves by the whites. So, the sun of freedom is there to remain. This is what he means by that particular sentence, right? Another important point in this lesson is responsibility and courage. You know, he speaks about courage. It's a very, very famous statement that he made. He gives a definition for courage. What is courage? Courage is not the absence of fear, but the strength to conquer it. So, whom do you call as a courageous man? A man who is not afraid of anything? No. So, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the strength to conquer fear. If you have the inner strength, if you are strong within, if you are determined within, then you have the courage because you don't have any more fear. You have the strength to conquer fear. So the strength of conquering fear is meant by courage. That is the definition that Nelson Mandela is giving for courage and learn the quotation. Very important quotation and very, very meaningful, deep in meaning or pregnant with meaning you can say. So, that is courage. Nelson Mandela proved to be courageous. He did not just give the definition and take rest. Or he did not kind of just lie back, sit back. No. He proved it by remaining in the press, I mean, prison for 27 long years to achieve something. That is the courage that he is speaking about. Right. The next point that he emphasizes is freedom. What is freedom? A beautiful explanation. Freedom is not doing whatever you like. Freedom is doing what you're supposed to do. Freedom is doing what is expected of you. Freedom is being responsible because freedom without responsibility is no freedom. That is what Nelson Mandela is talking about. So freedom is of two kinds. Responsibility. He's talking about responsibility. Freedom should bring responsibility. And what are the two kinds of responsibilities? Number one, responsibility towards your family, your relatives. Number one is family. Responsibility towards your family. You must be a good father. You must be a good mother. You must be a good son. You must be a good daughter. You must be a good husband. You must be a good wife. So, this is the freedom that comes, okay, in the circle of society. So, personal freedom. If you are a father, you must fulfill the duties of a father. If you are a son, you must fulfill the duties of a son towards his parents. If you are a daughter, you must fulfill your duties as a daughter. You must do what is expected of you. That is your personal freedom. Another freedom is another kind of what to say responsibility is being responsible to the society that you are living in. That is what he is talking about. Responsibility towards one's family, responsibility towards one's nation. So what are you doing for the country? It is very rightly asked by John F. Kennedy. Do not ask what the country has done for you, but ask what you have done for the country. So Nelson Mandela says, what have you done for your country? He's asking the question. You have a responsibility towards your country because you're living in the country. You are a citizen of your country. The country has given you birth. It has educated you. It has given you all the facilities. So what are your responsibilities towards your nation? It was that responsibility which made Nelson Mandela to suffer for 27 long years in prison. That responsibility. So when he was in college, he says, he was free to do anything. He went to college. Sometimes he didn't go. Sometimes he had a good time with his friends. He came home late night. 
And he says, my parents never asked me anything. They didn't question me. And I did whatever I liked. This was freedom to me at that time. But when I saw my brothers and sisters suffering, experiencing gender inequality, denied of basic rights such as education, health care, employment opportunities, then I began to ask, what am I doing? What is my responsibility towards the society? What is my contribution? I am happy. Is that enough? My brothers and sisters are sad. They are crying. They are weeping. They are living a life of slavery. What am I going to do for them? What is my responsibility towards them? He began to think. This is the freedom, the responsibility towards your country. And he says each and every one of us should feel that responsibility. Only then the country will progress. Otherwise the country will be stagnant. Its growth will be stunted. What is the meaning of stunted growth? It will not grow. So, he gives a clear definition of responsibilities, two responsibilities, one towards your family and the other towards your society. Strike a balance. Sometimes we are so involved with our families that we forget the nation. It should not be there. You have a role to play, a dual role, a double role, role towards your family and a role towards your country. So this is the kind of responsibility Nelson Mandela is talking about. And if you read the lesson, you will understand. Number three, another important point. He remembers the martyrs of the country. Who are the martyrs? Who laid the stones of foundation? Who laid the foundation? Who laid the stones of foundation for the freedom of South Africa? So he mentioned some leaders, right? Uh, Oliver Trombe, Thabo Mepke, and there are some other people, their pictures are there in the textbook. So on the inaugural speech, on the inaugural, in the, during his inaugural speech, he said, I thank these leaders from the bottom of my heart. Why does he thank? A question can be asked. Why does he thank all these national leaders? They were not there. They were not alive when he was delivering the speech, but still he remembers them. But why? He says that these are the people who laid the foundation for a strong nation that is South Africa. These people paid a heavy price. They paid a price through their sweat and blood and life. And because of their sacrifice, our country has become a free nation today. And Nelson Mandela began to work. He had worked with those leaders. They were the pioneers. They were the architects. They were the founding fathers. Founding fathers of a new nation. So he says, though they are not with me now, though they are not alive, I still am grateful to them and I will remain grateful to them forever because without them, this independence of Africa, which we are, which we have inherited today, would not have been a possibility. So remember, the question would be, why does he thank the martyrs? Why does he thank the martyrs? He thanks the martyrs because they have laid a foundation for a strong Africa. So these points can be kind of revised when you prepare for your exam. The last is, last but not the least, two important points. What are the two important points? One is the dust of snow and the other one is fire and ice. I will just give you the theme of the poem and then wind up because we don't have enough time to discuss all the details. The poem, Dust of Snow, written by Frost, is a very small poem. A very small incident. The poet is remaining inside his room during a cold winter. That is a cold December. December in the in the, in the European countries and in the United States is very harsh. Winter in these countries is very harsh. So December is a very, very hard month for them. Cold, minus, I mean the temperature drops down to minus 2 or even 3 degrees Celsius sometimes. So the poet was remaining in his room. He was trying to write something, but he couldn't. Why? Because the temperature, the coldness. So he said, now let me get out and relax myself. I want to take a walk. So when he took a walk outside his room, he went to the backyard of his house. And what did he see in the backyard of his house? Many trees. Remember? They were hemlock trees. Remember the name hemlock because it holds a lot of importance. 
He went through the hemlock trees. And no leaves were to be found on the hemlock trees. All of them were bare. They were bare trees. Why? Winter. December. No leaves. Trees were filled with snow. And he was walking beneath, I mean below the trees. Below the branches of the trees. And as he was walking, something strange happened. What was that strange incident? A crow that was sitting on the hemlock tree shook the tree and the powder, that is icicles or dust of snow fell on his shoulders. The moment the dust of snow fell on his shoulders, he became energized. The sad mood disappeared. The melancholic mood disappeared. The dullness disappeared and he became very, very relaxed, very energized, very active and he went back to his room to continue his work. So what has happened? Dust of snow has brought about the change. Dust of snow has brought about the change. Now, what does the poet want to say? Small things in life contribute to greater changes. That is a point that is stressed. Small things in life, small incidents in life, small happenings in life contribute to a greater change. That falling of the snow, that falling of the dust of snow brought about a cheerfulness in, in the poet. The second point, he takes two examples. He uses two objects in the poem. And what are the two objects? One is a hemlock tree. It's a poisonous tree. If you take the hemless, hemlock flowers and extract the juice out of them, and if you put one drop of that in your mouth, it is instant death. It is so poisonous, highly poisonous. But it is a poisonous tree that sends down the snow on the shoulders of the poet. That is number one. Second, crow. You see, crow is not a very lucky bird for most people all over the world. During the Middle Ages, the crow was declared as a bird of the devil. It is the devil that sends crow. So when somebody dies, you can see crows standing on the rooftop, perched on the rooftops. And the magicians, witches and wizards, they use uh, the, the feathers of the crow to make some magical potion. So it is considered as a bird that brings ill luck, a bird of ill omen. Not at all a good bird, not at all an auspicious bird, not at all a lucky bird. But here the poet gives the example of a crow. So hemlock tree is, is, is indicative of negativity. Crow is a bird which is again not a very lucky one. So both objects crow, the crow and the tree which are considered negative and bad by the society does something good and brings a change in the heart of the poet. So even negative things in life can teach us something positive. So it can give us something positive, can change our lives. So from negativity, there is a positivity that comes. So this is a point that he wants to drive. Another point, a very important point is that nature. Nature is the best teacher. Nature teaches you. That's what Wordsworth said. He was called as a nature poet. Anything that is related to nature can bring a change in our lives. So the nature, that is the crow and the hemlock tree, which are part of nature, brings about a great change in this poet and he's completely relaxed. So these are the points that you need to keep in mind. Nature can work wonders. From negativity, there is a positivity that can come and that positivity can change a man's life. Small things make great changes. Small things can become the cause of great changes. So we can go on discussing this poem, but time is limited and you need to focus on your other main things, right? Okay, now I'm coming to the last poem that is Fire and Eyes. Again, it is a poem by the same poet Frost. You know, Frost poems are very short, but the meanings are so deep that you get, you, you don't have enough time to discuss them. 
here two things are taken and the two things are nothing but fire and ice two objects which are contradictory in nature opposite in nature so one day somebody asked the poet that is frost how will the world end what would be the end of the world then the poet said some said some people said the world is going to end by fire what is the meaning of fire it is not just the fire that is burning the world will end in fire what do you mean by this the world will end in war and how can war be associated with fire weapons any kind of weapon that you use involves fire be it the bullets that whiz off a gun be it a cannonball that speeds out from a tank military tank be it the ak47s be it the rocket launchers be it the tomahawks bombers whatever the weapon may be fire is generated so the world has witnessed many wars the first world war ended up in the loss of lives of millions the second world war hitler he massacred 6 million jews fire but the poet is not talking about literal fire you have to understand it has a very deep meaning the fire that he talks about is anger and arrogance and pride and vengeance and hatred and all the vices what do you mean by vice a bad quality so the gun can take your life away but if your heart is filled with the fire of hatred that is more destructive than the bullet that comes out of a gun and takes off your life so i am living in a society i am relating with people but if my heart is filled with hatred to my brother to my neighbor that is more dangerous than the bullets that come off a tanker a battle tank or a gun so the hatred is the worst form of fire it is this fire that has to be put off it is this fire that has to die out it is this fire that has to be extinguished that is what he is talking about so the world will end in fire that is true but the fire of hatred is more dangerous than the fire that is produced by battle tanks and guns number 1 number 2 some people say the world will not end in fire but they will end in ice what does he mean by ice ice represents water so if there is a flood the temperature global warming is caused we see that today when the polar caps ice caps in the polar region when they melt there is a big flood the sea level is i mean rising up day after day year after year so there might be great floods there might be tsunamis there might be earthquakes and floods following that so the world world would end in fire as well as ice so this is one meaning for ice world may end in flood deluge but the ice does not represent only fire it represents insensitivity and coldness you are not bothered about the person who is living next to you you are not bothered about the people who are suffering in the society you are indifferent to the suffering of the people you are happy and that is all that matters to you i am happy my family is happy i have all the needs to live a happy life so i don't bother about the rest this is the ice that he is talking about so ice is not just ice that he talks about ice is the indifference the selfishness the hatred the coldness that your heart is filled with so if you are not sensitive to the needs of people around you your heart is filled with ice if you are proud and arrogant and jealous your heart is filled with fire so it is the fire and the ice that have to be tackled if this fire and this ice is out of your heart then the world will be a better place to live in so that exactly is the point that the poet is driving at
So read the poem. I will give you some more questions and answers. I will just post them. Read them and make yourself familiar with all these lessons. And the first two lessons in Footprints Without Feet, you have to read them and get the summary and the theme of those two stories. So I wish all of you a very good luck. Stay safe and keep revising. Work hard. Definitely you will be able to enjoy good results. Bye.